We're being such marks right now. Ah, the suspense! This is like a Jack Whelan novel. Oh. oh. Yeah. That was it? Yep. <laughs> oh. Someone forgot to bring the champagne glasses. To Charlie. To Charlie. That is just truly from the champagne region of France. All right, are we ready? Yeah. It's time to face the music. We are gathered here today to say goodbye to a friend. You know, in many ways, she was more than a friend, more than a human person. In some ways, she seemed just like the two-dimensional fantasy of a physics professor in Idaho. Mm -hmm. But to us, she'll always be a beloved friend. To the content. <laughs> to the content. Support us on Patreon to get bonus videos and to encourage us to keep doing this. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. We know what a... What a roller coaster this ride has been. A Ferris wheel, if you will. <laughs> We've gone round and around and around and around, and there have been times where we're like, we're not getting off this. <laughs> this will never end. <laughs> there have been times when Jack has pulled on the lever that makes the Ferris wheel go turbo. Mm -hmm. There have been times when it feels like the Ferris wheel's not moving at all. So we told you last week that we had two chapters left and that is true but we're going to be combining both of them into this chapter. First of all because we weren't really sure which one to dress in funeral attire for. Because we thought surely no author would wait till the last chapter to kill off the main character. That was the thought we had about it. But, but you never know with <laughs> if I know one thing from the Jack Whalen school of literary tricks. Mm -hmm. It's that you should never do what mainstream literature critics and experts say is a good thing. Absolutely. So. <laughs> also Tana's away next week. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing a combined one. We're having the funeral today. Speeding up the process. Godspeed, Charlie. Uh, I think that every single one of you has earned a drink. So if you're so inclined, go get yourself a beverage. Could be non-alcoholic if that's what you're feeling. And for those of you in legal states, uh, consider this a wake and bake. Let's jump right Let's into read. it. Into this solemn occasion. Chapter 13 and then 14 of Charlie. How unlucky is this the one she dies? <sighs> it began in April with complaints of pain in her side, but we blamed it on her having to pick up Adam all the time. But the pains became worse and I finally persuaded Charlie to see a doctor. Over a period of two weeks, he ran a series of tests. Then he asked me to come in and talk to him. I call bullshit right off the bat. There's no way he convinced Charlie to go to the doctor. I know. <laughs> if anything, know. he'd be like, don't you know that this is psychosomatic? How is your testimony I right know, he now? didn't even believe in, like, pregnancy sickness. Yeah. <laughs> At first, he talked about Adam and me, where my parents lived. I knew something was wrong because he was small talking with me when he had a waiting room full of patients thumbing through good housekeeping. What's wrong with my wife? He studied me closely and then said simply, Cancer. It's all through her body. I'm afraid there isn't much we can do now. No, you're wrong, I exploded. If you're such a great doctor, what are you doing in this town? I'm going to find a doctor who knows what he's doing. I hurried home to her. Sorry, she was what resting on the couch. What indication did he have that the doctor was bad just because he I, diagnosed I think he's her thinking, with cancer? Well, denial is, is like a big part of grief. So sure. I get it. He's like, well, if you were such a good doctor, you wouldn't be working in a small town. You'd be at some big city hospital. <laughs> I feel like that's pretty understandable given the situation. Charlie, you owe me a night alone, right? Right. Um, wait, sorry, what are you trying to manipulate your wife into right now? <laughs> <Hydrogen>. <laughs> Fine. Does it matter where we go? Why? I have a sudden wild urge to spend the night with you in Rochester, Minnesota, I replied, picking up the phone to make plane reservations. Hmm. That's where the Mayo Clinic is, isn't it? That was very perceptive. 
That's the one Mayo That's Clinic what she knew. nearby. She's like, wait a second. I know the location of every Mayo Clinic in this country, and there is one right there. What are you getting up to, bud? I mean, she's being tested for cancer. Tana, have some respect. All right. Oh, really? I lied? Well, while we're there, we might as well drop in and have them take a look at you. Sam, don't. I don't want to go anywhere. I stopped dialing. What do you want to do? Stay here in my home with my baby and my husband for as long as I can? I hung up and wondered what she knew. I phoned the nurse this afternoon and impersonated my mother. They told me what's wrong. Sorry. Why is it like being her husband or her mother means you can get information from the doctor, but being her, the patient, means she can't? Like, I feel like you shouldn't be giving that information out to family and friends. You should be giving it to her first. Yeah, what the hell? Is Are they so, keeping this a secret from her? Oh, no, this is the 80s, so I don't, I don't the know. Women did on. not have medical no. rights. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know anything. We can move you to Rochester or Denver or Salt Lake City. We could all move there until you're better. No, I want to be here watching my son grow up in his home. I built a little enclosed patio in our backyard and assembled a baby swing set for Adam. Charlie wanted a flower garden, so I picked up some plants in May and stuck them into the ground. Even as short as the growing season is in South Dakota, they lasted longer than she did. (laughs) Still gotta be in with the weather, weather comments. One night about 8 o'clock, Louise Atkins was at our door. Charlie said this morning she wasn't feeling well. I thought maybe she'd like me to nurse Adam. When she went into Charlie and asked her, Charlie started to cry with relief. Oh, thank you. I was worrying about that so much. No problem, Louise said quickly. Nothing was ever a problem for Louise. She continued to nurse Adam twice a day for the next month. Often when she came, she would have a big pot of stew. Can you help me out? I didn't know I had so much when I made this, and Rick refuses to eat it more than one meal, so if you don't take it, I'll just have to throw it out. We always help Louise out by taking the food she had cooked too much of, or by having Adam help use up some of her milk supply, or by allowing the Relief Society sisters, who absolutely needed a service project and couldn't think of a thing to do, to come in and clean for us. You know that this is how they've had to pitch it to him in order to let him accept just... Yeah, they have nothing else to do. (laughs) Otherwise he'd be like, no, I don't accept charity from anyone. In the beginning, while I was still working, I would come home from work and there would be a casserole in the oven, fresh homemade bread on the counter, a salad and jello in the refrigerator. Most of the time, I never knew who had brought them. And somehow during my time at work, the house was mysteriously cleaned, the carpet vacuumed, and our laundry washed and folded. To this day, I don't know who did it. The Relief Society is like that. That has its own paragraph, that sentence. The Relief Society it's is powerful. like that. It's powerful. I'm going to say that's the one part of Mormonism that really works. The casserole system. Both sets of parents came as soon as they heard. It was very difficult. We couldn't seem to face it head on at the time, even though we all knew what was coming. We found ourselves fantasizing about new treatments, about places in Mexico where they cured all diseases with natural herbs, about people who had suddenly gotten well from the same disease. And we never mentioned, even to each other, the word cancer. My father and I administered to her. We wanted to promise her that she would completely recover, but there was a feeling that it was not to be. We ended up promising her that God loved her and Adam and me and that he would provide for all our needs. i got to change out of this skirt. It's too uncomfortable. I need to be able to grieve comfortably. You have to be able to mourn. I'm going to be so quick. In the comfort of your own home. So they're going to go hit up the medicine man, right? The what? They're going to hit up the medicine man, right? You think after everything we've read. Yeah. That's like the one thing that we know so far that really works. Okay, I'm in my grieving yoga pants. (laughs) And I'm ready to continue. (laughs) <laughs> These pants have attended many a funeral. <laughs> Charlie wanted to stay at home as long as she could, and so in May, I quit my job. Then I was forced to ask our parents for help. Forced to ask your parents for help when your wife's dying of cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Some unhealed, like, yeah. parental wounds, like, has not fully individuated. The one thing that had always been the hardest for me. Your wife has cancer! Ah... Uh... You can ask for help, little Sam. It's okay. Let people love you. But suddenly, I was dependent upon everyone. Our parents jointly set up what they called a bottomless checking account, and they made sure I never got the bank statement. I just wrote checks from it. That's nice. Sam, quit hovering over me. I hate it when you hover. This was a good day. Near the last. Every other day was good. I sat down on the bed beside her. It's time for a pill now. I don't want it yet. It fogs my mind, and I want to talk. We had avoided talking about her condition for days and were back to talking about the weather again, just as we had on our first date. So I wasn't prepared for what she said. 
This Sam. is this is just classic Sam using his wife's last moments to discuss his favorite topic, <laughs> the weather. <laughs> Sam, where are you going to find another wife after I'm gone? I've got a wife. We were married for time and eternity. You'll always be my wife. She's like, no, in order to enter the highest level of the celestial kingdom, you need to be polygamous. Monogamy is no part of the economy of heaven, Sam. <laughs> Didn't you read the Journal of Discourses? <laughs> I mean a wife who can give you what you need. I don't need anything, Charlie. Come on, you're not even 30 years old yet. Of course you're going to need a wife. <laughs> <laughs> and my son needs a mother. So where will you go? I don't want to talk about it. But I do. I've thought about the single women around here, and there's none of them in the church you'd be happy with, is there? I started to cry. I don't want anyone else. I want you. Oof. Oh, God, this is actually getting a bit rough. I'm going to cry in real life. Come on, Sam. Where's your male chauvinism when you really need it? I was kneeling by the bed with my head next to her, and I was crying. She reached out and touched my hair. It's going to be all right, she assured me. No, it isn't. I've thought about it and I've prayed about it, she said, running her fingers over my hair. When Jesus was about to die, he told the apostles that there were many mansions in heaven and that he was going to prepare a place for them. And that's what I'm going to do, Sam. I'll go ahead and find us a nice little mansion. Sam, look at me. I look <laughs> a tiny little McMansion, like <laughs> one you would see in Holiday or Daybreak. <laughs> we'll have the highest carbon footprint. It'll be lovely. I looked up and tried to memorize every feature of her face. In 50 years, you come and meet me in our little mansion, okay? Okay, I said. Do you want a swimming pool, or is that too ostentatious? Charlie, I can't take this. Poor Sam, she said as my tears cascaded down. Answer me about the swimming pool. Do you want it or not? I mean, I'm like, just go with the swimming pool. Yeah, like, be like, like, yeah, baby. No one's ever like, oh, I wish the swimming pool wasn't here in this heavenly place where I can have whatever I want. Even if you only use it once a year. But he said, no, he doesn't want a swimming pool. And then Ugh. she said, me either. They're just kind of a lot of bother. But a racquetball court, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Yes. It's so cute how Mormons imagine heaven as just being like exactly like the human existence they've always known. Like they, they can't like think bigger than that. Except I won't have any problems. I could just skateboard forever. Or racquetball or and whatever. My Jeep will always is. work and I'll always be able to get it out of four wheel drive. I sat beside her and held her hand. Somehow making definite plans about our being together after this life took away some of the terror. Yeah, there it is. That's real. Now, about your next wife, Sam. I suggest you move back to Salt Lake and move in with your parents. That way Adam's grandmas can sm spoil him rotten. Then you look around for someone. Now this is important and I want you to remember it. Find someone I can... Oh. <laughs> Find someone I can get along with. You're not only looking for a wife for you, but you're looking for a sister for me. I understand I'll have to share you with her in heaven. And we don't want any violent arguments between me and her there, do we? Okay, so this book is at a time when the church still was just like, yep, polygamy, that's how it's going to be. I mean, this church is, I mean, they're not like outright yeah, saying yeah, yeah. that. They're trying to hide that. But, but the is fact a bit is more outright than... that like multiple apostles have multiple spouses that they're yeah. planning on being with in eternity. So like when they're like, we don't encourage or teach polygamy. It's not doctrine. It's like bullshit. It's here in Charlie. Charlie is on the church website. Charlie is canon. You're going to love the next line. So we don't want any violent arguments between me and her, do we? What would the neighbors think? Especially if the neighbors are people like Moses or Harold B. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Moses is like, the fuck? Don't put me next to that bitch. Harold B. Lee, the one who famously said that uh, people with handicaps were less valiant in the in the pre-mortal realm. So and nice. they came here with disabled bodies because of their wickedness. <laughs> Yeah, he'd be Heaven. a great neighbor. <laughs> Love that guy. Yeah, he probably would be a really judgy neighbor, so she's right to be worried. I'll remember. <laughs> oh, she said with a grin. And it'd be all right with me if she loves to do housework and cook. This is how Mormon men think about fucking... And women think about polygamy. They're like, well, someone to share the housework with. Because even in, like... In this state of eternal glory, you just can't imagine yourself outside of the role of, like housework it is absurd. it is absurd to you're think all about. powerful and you're having to do housework wouldn't mm -hmm. it just be like <laughs> but then again it's like being all powerful wouldn't be fun because then like you wouldn't get the dopamine from like finishing a load of dishes so, like what are you getting dopamine from ultimately it comes down to like they just they want exactly what they have just <clears throat> a little better yeah. not so many people doing other things everyone will just think that they're awesome and everyone will get congratulated for living their boring little lives imagine being with sam for eternity it would be so boring. Oh, bonkers boring. Eternity is so incomprehensible. That was a good day, but there were bad days. 
Adam was almost a year old, a handsome boy with eyes like large black olives. He had few words, the ones he needed the most, dink for drink, for example. Charlie could occasionally get him to say daddy, but he didn't seem to feel any great motivation to talk. At first I didn't realise what she was doing. I only knew that when she was awake and feeling good enough, she went with him through each of the children's books with pictures of animals. Bird, Adam. Bird. He would look at the picture and mumble something. No, honey, it's a bird. Can you say it for me? Then I would leave to go downstairs to do some laundry, and when I came back up, she'd be looking at another book with him. One afternoon, as I was in the kitchen peeling some potatoes, I heard her again. Mummy, Adam, mummy. No answer. Mummy, Adam, please say it. Mummy. I peeked into the living room where she was sitting. She had a picture of herself and was pointing to the picture and then to herself, and was saying over and over again, Mummy, Adam, mummy. <laughs> I ducked back into the kitchen and cried silently while she attempted to leave in his mind some record of her presence. <laughs> please, Adam, please say my name. I'm your mummy. Please remember me. But Adam crawled off, and then she broke down too. A few days later, I woke up at two o'clock, as I had been doing automatically for the past weeks to give her a pill. I turned on a nightlight so I could see to make it into the kitchen for a glass of water. Charlie wasn't in bed. I found her in Adam's room by his crib, her arms stretched through the bars of the crib, touching him, sobbing quietly. Apparently, she had crawled into his room, wanting to hold him again. But because of her weakness, she couldn't lift him and had sunk to the floor in defeat. She could only reach him through the bars of the crib. I knelt down beside her. I want my baby, she cried. She couldn't leave him at night after that. I dragged in the top mattress from our bed and plopped it on the floor beside Adam's crib and then brought in the blankets and pillows. Oh my God, this is getting to me. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> We slept that way for the rest of the time she was still in the house. Oh, God. Jack Whalen got you us. Bastard. <laughs> Adam would first go to sleep in his crib. Then I would lift him out and place him between us on the mattress on the floor. It's just oh. like this whole thing exists as some like masturbatory Mormon fantasy to like prop up their religion but it's like also people's spouses do die and it's really sad mm -hmm. okay so i'm now actually i'm surprised that one of the most emotionally intense scenes of the movie was actually written by jack himself it seems like they've kind of had to rein in jack's imagination and creative license <laughs> in order to make it more palatable uh -huh. so uh -huh. the movie. but that was that Crazy. was a, a potent part of the movie and an even more potent part of the book well, we have got four pages left of this book. <laughs> yep. Oh, so it's just, that's the we end. We are just like, ready she to is wrap just up. She is dead now. She is She's gone. dead. I'm looking for the other wife <laughs> now. Pre-order my new book to see how my dating adventures go. <laughs> First, I'm going to start with blondes, and then I'm going to move on to Californians. I felt great oh, heartache man. as I watched Charlie slowly become weaker. But even so, after we had talked about continuing our marriage in heaven, I felt that our love would never die. You know, your love never dies no matter what, because as long as you, as long as Sam exists as a human on this planet, he's going to feel love for her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, life can only be transferred from one source to another. I wanted to know how this appeared to the saviour. He lives and knows each of us by name, and his love for us is completely unconditional. How did he view the imminent passing away of my wife? We had been faithful to the covenants we made in the temple, the Saviour was aware of the joy awaiting in heaven after the resurrection. This thing that to us was such a great tragedy, what was it to him who saw beyond the grave? Did he understand the depths of my sorrow? Then I remembered the raising of Lazarus. Ah, oh, there we go. He planted that and back. back. Mary and Martha weeping for the loss of their dear brother. Brother? Yeah, you know how Mary we're all, Magdalene? We all okay. siblings in God's eyes. As they all trudged up the hill to the tomb. Jesus was certain that in five minutes Lazarus would come forth. What if he had turned to Mary and told her not to cry and that everything would be okay? What if he had treated lightly her sorrow? Instead, he wept. He wept because they wept and because he shared their sorrow. He wept because he loved them and whatever grief they carried, even for a short time, he shared it with them. I wish this was a thing that was like extrapolated more extensively in the Mormon church. Like I wish empathy. <laughs> yeah. I wish Mormons would weep with those that weep, but there is like a set, so like there's a, there's a specific set of things that they'll weep for with you, but then there are things that they won't. Because while they believe in a God with unconditional love, they actually don't believe that that love is unconditional because you have to jump through these, all these hoops and meet all these conditions in order to meet, receive the full measure of love. 
So in their minds, there are some things that just ought not be wept for or with. Hey, Banksy. Banksy, you said Right now, too. I weep with Banksy because he's not getting his dinner, and he wants it so bad. He's just sad about Charlie. He has a lot to say. <clears throat> he would not leave me comfortless because he loves me, and he loves Charlie, and he loves our son, Adam. He wept because he loves us. Also, the tie-in of, like, we had, we've been faithful to the covenants we made, so therefore, it's like, the implication is, like, we're more deserving of, like, the <laughs> Savior's love and respect. But there well, really yeah. is a lot of stuff in Mormonism <laughs> that the LDS people at least doctrinally, are sort of prevented from having empathy for. Mm -hmm. And some people do anyway, despite the doctrine. But there's a lot of, um, you brought this on yourself. I mean, even prosperity gospel, which, I mean, Jack has preached throughout this book. Mm -hmm. By the middle of August, Charlie's condition had deteriorated so much that I couldn't take care of her by myself anymore. I had to get her to a hospital. Louise came by to take care of Adam. Please don't let Louise be Sam's next wife. You don't think she will be, right? No. She has a husband. She has a husband. No. I picked Charlie up in my arms and we walked into Adam's room, where he had just been put down for a nap. Louise picked him up again so Charlie could kiss him one more time. Mummy, he smiled, saying the word for the first time. As we passed the shopping centre, Charlie looked out the window and asked me to stop. There in the parking lot, set up for the weekend in its red, white and blue splendour, was a Ferris wheel. Uh, I thought he was going to say an American flag. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> this country, oh this great country that Charlie and I had the opportunity to live in. <laughs> I drove as close as I could to it and parked. Please, she asked. Leaving her there in the car, I talked to the attendant, offering him a $20 bill if he would reserve it for us for one ride. Then I walked to the car and gingerly picked her up in my arms and held her while we soared again over the uncaring cl- crowds below. <laughs> oh, the uncaring, you don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I think most uh, people would be pretty caring about someone with terminal cancer riding a Ferris wheel. Mm -hmm. After two or three minutes, the pain was too intense, and she begged me to take her to the hospital. When she was in the hospital, I divided my time between her and Adam. My son and I spent hours in the park. For some reason, I hated to go home. At the last... At the last, she was kept heavily sedated. Is that a phrase? At the last? Is that like an outdated phrase I don't know about? Kind of, I guess. When our parents came, near the end, she didn't even recognise them. I sat by her bed and, because of her thirst, put little drops of water one by one into her mouth. I think she appreciated it, but she never gained consciousness enough to tell me. Then it was over. She died on my birthday. Mm. I've never been able to decide what she meant by that. I'm going to ask her when we meet again. She didn't die to tell you something, man. She like, just died. Fuck you, died. Sam. <laughs> you are truly a piece of work. <laughs> Before the funeral, men from the elders' quorum came with a rental truck and loaded our belongings. When my mother-in-law understood did, did what they I had mean- to convince him that he was doing them a favor. <laughs> I think he's going to do the Native American thing (laughs) the indian way of giving (laughs) away all their belongings Uh. when my mother-in-law understood what i intended to do with them she cautiously asked why i told her it was what charlie would want charlie would have liked the funeral not because it was so crowded nor for the nice things people said about her nor because the relief society sisters sang two songs but because there were so many lamanites there (laughs) you see they had adopted her (laughs) He's just lead like he's being like this is like in the era of uh, Spencer W. Kimball. Mm-hmm. He's like trying to show that he is on board with institutional racism to the very end. Yeah, institutional <laughs> racism disguised as goodwill. Oh. There was a graveside service on that windy, blustery day, and the wind kept blowing over the flower vases while we gathered to dedicate the grave. It couldn't even wait until we left. After the graveside service and the luncheon, I gave away everything that had been loaded in the truck. It started with the things that didn't mean anything to me. The furniture. This just seems like a really bad way to deal with a death. Like, I don't care if it's the Indian way or not. I'm like, how is it going to help Sam to have no belongings while grieving? Like, you need a home. You need stuff. You don't want to have to be like, shit, i got to buy a new sofa. <laughs> you know, you want to not have to think about that stuff. I just, I just don't really get it. He's on his parents' credit card. He's like, ah, yeah, I he's hated like, her I'm design a anyway. I'm number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just really make the decor in here grim. <laughs> he's like, I'm bachelor padding, bitch. <laughs> but when it came time to give away the clothes that had been hers, it was very difficult for me. Charlie's mother came and stood by my side and helped me. 
I'm sure some of the clothes had belonged to Charlie since before she had been married. Still no name. Still no name. (laughs) Some of them must have brought back memories to her mother, but she bravely assisted me. We gave most of her clothes to Celia. Couldn't she be the recipient of some of the belongings? Like... Yeah, you'd think that the parents would deserve some of them. I'm sure Charlie approves. I gave everything away, all that we had in our home, except what Adam and I needed in Salt Lake City. Oh, okay. And Adam's Christmas presents, which we kept. Okay, wait, so they moved to South Dakota so that she couldn't have any other connections, right? Like, that was what she was, like, talking to her parents and things. Yeah, and he was like, nope, shut it down. Yeah, she died parents. And, she, and he <laughs> took her to South Dakota, the most boring place in the, guy, the United States of God died. Bless America. And then she died. And then she got cancer because she probably lived by some fucking oil refinery. And the minute she died, he goes back to Salt Lake. It was... Pretty telling. <laughs> it literally was just to get her away from her alcoholic parents. Uh, then I drove both sets of parents to the airport and waited with them until the plane was called. Oh, God. I can't believe Jack. I can't believe this. Charlie's mother, her face without makeup, which means she is now a redeemable figure that we can have empathy for. Wow. Because she's not wearing makeup. That's how grieving she is. She's let go of her plastic appearance. Hope we've all learned a little something about character arcs. (laughs) (laughs) Threw her arms around me and cried. Sam, there couldn't have been a better husband to her than you. (laughs) Apparently, That is a a woman woman (laughs) maddened with distress. (laughs) She's not thinking straight. She loved you so. You took her away from her parents because you thought they were a bad influence on her. Because of your little cult thing. Her father grabbed my hand. Please, always be our son. We don't have anyone else now. That's fucked up. I just like... They got Mark. He's running for Senate. Seriously, (laughs) adopt Mark. He's the best son you'll ever have. My parents told me that as soon as they got home that day, they would arrange a place for Adam and me to stay. I'm going to buy a swing set for the backyard right today. It will be waiting for Adam when you arrive tomorrow. The plane was called again. We hugged each other and they left. As I drove home, I passed the restaurant where Charlie and I had played out our little fantasy, and my words came back. I'm recently widowed. Oh, shit. I pulled up to the house and walked one more time through the now empty rooms. In that house, I could tell you every nail that Charlie had driven. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The woman is dead, Samantha. (laughs) Grief brings out the worst in all of us. Sometimes we just need some levity to survive. It was all gone, and I was as empty as the rooms that now echoed my footsteps. Just as we were about to leave the house for the last time, a beat-up old pickup rattled its way up our road. It stopped in our driveway, and a young, dusty couple, both in jeans and western shirts, approached us happily. The woman was carrying a little boy in her arms. A dusty couple? (laughs) Do you remember us, she asked. No, I'm sorry. I'm Sherry Wilson, and this is my husband, Don. Don't you remember? I we really took it to heart oh. what you said about polygamy. We would like to <laughs> start a fundamentalist commune with you. How do you feel about it? Wait, this is the um, the rodeo clown. Uh huh. I stared at them numbly. I stayed with you after I had my baby. Oh yes, How I answered. How could he not remember someone who stayed in his house just after having her baby? I know the baby's like one. <laughs> the baby's Adam's age. He's like rodeo clown doesn't ring a bell. I've met many rodeo clowns. You're gonna have to be more specific. We're on our way to a Labor Day rodeo, but we just had to stop in and say hello. Is Charlie here? She asked, looking at the house. I couldn't tell them. Maybe I wanted to spare them the sorrow, but I don't think that was it. They were the first people I should have informed... Why were they the first people you should have informed that your wife was dead? Because he never made any real friends. (laughs) (laughs) And I couldn't bring myself to say it. If I never say it, maybe it wouldn't be true. She's not here right now, I said. This is interesting because this is the final paragraphs of the entire book and this is like what we're focused on and, and our the battery, battery is flashing. Dying. This is... Let's just change the battery. Yeah. So again, just want to remind everyone we're just one paragraph away from the end of the book. She's not here right now, I said. Oh, that's too bad, Sherry said. Look, when you see her, tell her that after she told me so much about the Mormons, Don and I looked into it. We were baptized six months ago. As if you wouldn't have reached out sooner if that had happened. Like, how big is this town? What did you look into exactly? Uh, Tell her we're planning to go through the temple and be sealed as soon as we can. This is seriously just like an Enzyme article, an extended Enzyme article. And tell her how much we love her for what she did for us. I'll tell her when I see her again, I said, as cheerfully as I could. I watched... uh, Just... uh, Seriously, like, the superiority complex right to the end. 
I watched their pickup bounce away from me down the dusty road. Then Adam and I left for Salt Lake City to find a home. Well, at least a temporary home. Until the time when we're called home, capital H home, and we find out what Charlie has arranged for us that will be more permanent. Very That's sterile it. way to end. <laughs> very sterile. <sighs> he was just like, and I, she's dead, and I guess that's <clears> it. <laughs> but now I'm dating blondes. Other blondes. Other blondes. Maybe a California. No, he'll do a brunette He's next. done the East Coast He's liberal He's done the elite. East Coast now liberal Now it's time elite. for a West Coast. West Coast, brunette. Uh-huh. I mean, that's basically it. Brunette, I don't know if he would stoop so low. No, that would be <laughs> such a downgrade after a blonde. Yeah, he's got to step it up now. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Wow, I mean, where do we, what, <laughs> what do we, what do we? <laughs> this has been such a journey. This. And it ended as, just <clears throat> as, <laughs> pathetically as a peaky <laughs> Well, a toast to Charlie. You to- finished your champagne, your yeah. half bottle of the champagne. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, some things I loved about Charlie. You know, she really did seem to have empathy that other characters in the story did not have. Mm-hmm. Um, I get the sense that she cared about knowing everyone's names. Yes. And thought everyone <laughs> is important. She was respectful of other people who weren't a part of her belief system. Um... It, it's a shame that she was so wounded from presumably past traumas that she felt she had to marry Sam, a straight-laced, serious-minded Utah Mormon, <laughs> which puts it lightly, I think, and really doesn't get into the nitty-gritty of Sam's character. No. Um, I just hope she's having a better time out there than she had with Sam. So true, bestie. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my bestie? Aw. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> ah how do you end a series like this what do we do next we've thought about reading the is the sequel called sam yeah the sequel is Ugh. called sam we've thought that's about a, that doing sounds that. like all the worst parts of this book and only that yeah we are thinking if we do sam it's going to be for patreon because i mean these videos while they have been some of our favorite ever like they are a lower view count and like we got to earn a living. We got to pay rent. The mm-hmm. champagne costs $6 for this video. It's like, we'll be lucky to even make break even. Make that back. <laughs> so if you have enjoyed these series, please go over to our Patreon and support us there. You can pay very little and uh, we'll be very grateful. Just remember, I, I know <clears> that <throat> if you guys are anything like me, this is a very hard time for you right now. And remember that there's no right way to grieve. Grieving is not linear. Uh, if you find yourself feeling without purpose totally. or meaning in the world uh-huh. without Charlie, mm-hmm. just know that just I support understand. Us on Patreon. <laughs> You've seen me drink my way through it today. Don't follow, you know, in my footsteps. Yeah. Um, because there's probably more uh, God God honoring ways of grieving. Yeah. Uh, like maybe writing out a book that. Or converting some Lamanites. Yes. <laughs> um, if you feel like throwing some casual racism in the direction of a Native American, don't do it. <laughs> just actually, just stop just and actually, don't. Just sh- actually, <laughs> I would love for you guys to leave your toasts to Charlie yes. in the comments. Um, I really do hear- feel like I'm going to miss this series in a, in like a, there will be a small amount of grief for me. I'm going to say this is the thing that I've enjoyed doing most on uh-huh. this channel. I've heard people say that this has been very grounding for them as a weekly thing. This is the most consistent we've ever been. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really feel like Charlie has given us a new lease on life in a way. Charlie saved us. So, uh, yeah, if you have suggestions for what we do now, like what do we do every Tuesday night? <clears throat> please let us know. We could do a eulogies video for Patreon where we like read out eulogies to Charlie. I think that would be really nice. Uh, I just feel like we're all in this together. Like we've gone on this journey for like 13 fucking weeks. Mm-hmm. People have spent probably at least eight hours <laughs> immersed in this with us. They'll never get that back. You'll never get that time back. <laughs> so you better hope you've been changed by it. Or what was it all for? Yeah. Thank you for for joining us. Yeah, May we you. all be more like Charlie. May we all be the wildly creative, fun-loving New York sophisticate <laughs> that we were born to be. On this Ferris wheel we call life. <laughs> okay, we love you. So sorry that all good things must come to an end. Yeah. Even Charlie. Yeah. 
Oh, can't wait to find out who Sam's going to marry next. I mean, uh-huh. surely he's learned so much from Charlie. He's ready to be... I mean, she's like set him up to be a better husband for someone else. Surely. Um, Jack Wayland exceeded my expectations by not addressing a single toxic behavior of Sam this no. whole time. If he's Andrew- just had free license to just be the biggest asshole and there has not been a single reckoning, not and a single moment of, of accountability. And some of the people that he was the shittiest to, a.k.a. Charlie's parents, <laughs> who lest we forget, he never cared about Charlie's mother, he just insulted her for wearing a ton of makeup and then the dad... And told her to leave his house. He was like weirdly resentful towards the dad for offering the money when they need it as newlyweds. Um, those people, for whatever reason, Charlie could loved li- him more than more than anyone else in the world. She could have lived out uh, the remaining the the last years of her life in middle class luxury, but instead she was like in the fucking homestead. homesteading in South Dakota, but just so that I- she wouldn't be exposed to any. Well, you know, I think she had to do that because that was where the Lamanites were. She was there for the light. There's no Lamanites in Salt Lake City. I, we keep saying Lamanites and we do it ironically, but we every are time doing... a little part of me <laughs> dies, know, I'm like, I know. <laughs> But I think we've, like, I think we've. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I think our sentiments are known at this point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. See ya. See you on the this other side, y'all. This has been a y'all. good time, yeah. Until we. Until we meet Til again. Until we meet. Till we meet. Till we meet. Charlie's feet too.